In Between the Sprockets is brought to you by ComCopy, the duplication specialist. Good evening and welcome to Sprockets, the movie and video review show with a bent edge. I'm Robert Ellsworth. And I'm Madeline Swain. Tonight we'll be looking at the suspense-filled film Le Patriot, and we'll also be looking at Jessica Lange's new politically correct movie, Losing Isaiah. Oh no, not another PC film! Hush, 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 this one's actually quite good. And we'll also be looking at giving away some more Tango tickets, so get your papers and pens ready. And for all you pervs out there who want to know whose naughty bits we're going to look at tonight, you're going to have to hold on. Mm, but. First, let's take a peek at the Patriot. Well, <laughs> 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 Doesn't that look exciting? Tel Aviv, 1983. Two young people are pulled out of their car, beaten, interrogated by the police, and then released. One of them is a Frenchman, Ariel Brenner, played by Ivan Attal. He's come to Israel not long after his 18th birthday, ditching his home and family in Paris without a word of explanation, because his goal is to become a Mossad agent. I once dated an agent provocateur. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't think you'll be interested in an agent like this because they're pretty intense. Have a look for yourself. <laughs> for those of you like me who are unaware, the Mossad is a phantom organization. Music of the night. She's still hurting out for losing out at that theater restaurant production of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Greatest Hits. I got a recall for Cats once. Really? Which part? The litter box in the Snappy Tom commercial. Oh. Anyway, the Mossad, unlike the CIA, doesn't doesn't answer to anybody. Even the Israeli Prime Minister doesn't know everything they're up to. Hmm. It's a real cloak and dagger operation that's still supported 100% by the Israeli public.
femme qui s'est fait renverser. Une vraie boucherie. Director Eric Rochon's new film attempts to be a gripping tale of the seduction of power. Mm. Ariel leaves his family behind in Paris. Mm. And here's a little bit of movie trivia for you. His sister is played by Capuchin Rochon, presumably some relation, and she was previously known for washing Isabelle Huppert's hair in <laughs> no, Entre Nous. No, 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 no. Not another hair movie, Madeleine. Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Ariel assumes a whole bunch of aliases, and life as a spy goes pretty smoothly until he meets a statuesque blonde cool girl for whom he falls hooker, line and sinker. Hooker! Hooker, line and sinker. And unfortunately something happens to her and nobody will tell him exactly where she is or if she's dead or if she's alive or whatever and he starts to lose faith in Mossad. This is compounded by his experiences with a Jewish American spy who's forced to spy in his own country and he's not happy at all about that. And guess who plays his wife? Oi vey, who is it? Nancy Allen, who we haven't seen for a long time, have we? Nice to see her again. Been worried about her. Hey, Shalom. My wife, Catherine. Kathy, this is Rafi Shabbat, the guy I told you about from Tel Aviv. So you had a good trip? Yes. Jeremy loves Tel Aviv. He talks about it all the time. Can I speak with you a moment? No, well, Kathy and I don't have any secrets from each other. I'd like to speak with you a moment, please. I really wanted her to meet you. I've been talking about you for the last three months. You have to understand, Kathy's my whole world. She's my promised land. You should leave her out of this. I'm not saying this for you, I'm saying it's for her. Evan comes across as a very competent actor, but he can't seem to get rid of that strange and serious look on his face. He looks a little like Sparrow when he does that, don't you think? <laughs> yes, he does, of course. Sparrow is a lot cuter. And Sandrine Kibbelin, who plays the hooker, she only has like three lines in the whole film, but boy does she make the most of them. She steals every scene she's in, and I spent half the movie waiting for her to come back. Yeah, she's got a great pair of knockers, too. And I really, I agree with you on Sandrine's uh, performance. It was wonderful. But most of the portrayals in the film were quite bland. Uh, there are a few exceptions, inc including Christine Pascal's wonderful scene where she unhooks the phone so she can tap it. Oh, yeah, that's a great right. scene. Very clever. What I've done, I don't understand. What I've done. cause de l'avortement. C'est toi qui voulais. Mais me parle pas comme ça. Mais tu peux pas me parler comme ça. Dis-moi que c'est pas toi qui me parle comme ça, je t'en supplie. Je t'en supplie, dis-moi que c'est pas toi qui me parle comme ça. Unfortunately, I found most of the film rather dull and plodding. What did you think? It's also at least 20 minutes too long. Mm. But then I've never seen a film about Mossad before, so that kept my interest. And I really did like seeing old Capuchin Rochon again. That was nice. So at least for that, I'll give it a six. Mm. For a film about intrigue, it was a little somniferous. I give it a five. I've always been a great fan of Jessica Lange. She's adept at pushing my emotional buttons, and in her latest film, Losing Isaiah, she plays a white social worker who adopts a black child whose mother, a crack addict, abandons him in the trash. She must drink lots of milk and eat green vegetables if she wants to be a good mother. The doctor Kyle, what's the matter? tells her not to drink any alcohol or take any medicine, it could harm her baby. She should get lots of sleep. Kyla, look at me. What's wrong? When the crackhead, skillfully portrayed by Halle Berry, cleans up her act, she finds herself in a custody battle with Jessica Lange, and it gets pretty nasty. It sounds a little bit like a TV movie of the week, if you ask me. I didn't ask you. Okay, just joking. It would be like a TV movie of the week, except for Naomi Foner's brilliant 
multi-layered script really saves the day. Yeah, I mean, she also wrote the underrated Running on Empty with Ruth of Phoenix. Yeah, I think that won an Academy No, it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. And I think it actually won the Golden Globe Award for it. Hmm. Unfortunately, the film kind of plodders along, and even with a brilliant screenplay, it tends to take issues like racism in America and sanitize them just a little too much. Look in the mirror. Look at my face. I'm his mother. God says so. Take yours. I didn't have to take them. You threw them away, remember? An animal can give birth. That doesn't make it a mother. Oh, so you call me an animal? If you think you're just gonna walk up in this court and take my baby like you take some puppy from a pound, you got another thing coming, lady. Because you ain't gonna take my baby from me. <laughs> He's not a baby. You don't even know him. You don't know anything about him. Wait. Don't do this. Don't do this to Isaiah. Don't do what? Tell him the truth? That his real mama is as black as he is? Black. All you people think about is color. You people? You people? Well, me and Isaiah, we the same kind of people. But didn't you know it? The performances, as can be expected, are top-notch. Yeah, Hal Berry proves that you can play more than one-dimensional sex bombs, and Joa Lee, Spike's sister, makes a welcome cameo. Samuel L. Jackson, who seems to be in everything that I <laughs> see lately, gives a powerful and insightful performance as the lawyer who takes on the crackhead's case in order to set a precedent. And Mark Jeffries, who plays Desire, has an amazing sense of concentration for a four-year-old. Unlike we do on this show. Hey, come on. <laughs> yes, he's certainly better than most of those snot-nosed kids that come out of Hollywood these days. Sorry, Drew. Isaiah, this is the lady that's going to I take you to Kyla's house. You want to come okay? with me? No. It's going to be all right. Isaiah. Let me just take it. I swear right? it'll be all right. Ready to go? Here. It's going to be all right. Yeah. Why don't you just let me take it? It'll be better. Here, you'll get used to it. Can you do this? Why don't you just let me take it? All right, honey. I promise you it'll be all right. Just take it. Please let me there. Mr. Gomez said it'll be all right. Come Take it. Just a minute. As usual, Jessica Lange gives a heart-wrenching performance. She's got to be one of the few Hollywood glam actresses who hasn't had surgery. Mm. The film uh, deals on one level with the depiction of divergent classes, but it fails in a lot of other issues. Uh, I disagree. I think the, work, the film works well until the um, typical idealized Tinseltown twist. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that I give the film about a 5. I give Miss Lange's performance a 10. And I give the producers a pat on the back for getting a PC movie made. I like Jessica Lang as well. I'm going to give it a seven. But I have to admit, I think they <coughs> just trivialize just a tiny bit America's racial problems. Yes, I think they get the PC award for that. Coming up next, Naughty Bits. This famous Aussie bottom wiggling scene gave new meaning to the term down under. You might never know it by looking at that darling derriere, but it actually belongs to old Jack Thompson, who has put on a few extra kilos on those buttocks since his 1975 film, Sunday Too Far Away. The story concerned a solid chap, played by the affable Thompson, who would like to quit his job as a sheep shearer. Alright, the plot may not be too exciting, but Jack's bottom surely is. And you buffs out there will probably notice that he reprised that scene in The Some of Us last year. <laughs> I have written in full of how my sister died, how I, the Baron Hartog, avenged her death. The enemies I sought were no ordinary mortals. They were murderers from beyond the grave. For this ruined castle 
where I lay in wait, had once been the home of the Karnstein family. And at certain times, their evil spirits thrust out from their mouldering tombs and took a kind of human shape to roam the countryside and seek for victims to satisfy their need, their passion, their thirst for blood. Hi. That was the opening shot of The Vampire Lovers. I'm Maud Davy, and I understand I'm the first guest reviewer on In Between the Sprockets and I'm very flattered. I love this film. It is pure tack, but in the manner of all pure tack, it's the most glorious mix mixture of porn and art house, which doesn't promise much but delivers much more. I first saw this film last year when I was playing a character called Erzsébet Bathory, who's a real-life Hungarian countess who had the habit of bathing in the blood of young women. Um, she lived around the turn of the 17th century, and two centuries later, an Irishman called Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu wrote a short story called Camilla, and this was probably the first of the lesbian vampire genre, the first female vampire. The Vampire Lovers, this film, is based on that story. My dear Countess, I am honoured. General Bill Thorpe, so charming of you to invite us. May I, may I present my daughter, Marcine? Who is that? They've just moved into a place about five kilometres away. You know, where the old Baroness used to live. Well, we must love our neighbours, Kurt. Will you dance, Candace? Oh, enchanted. It's the story of Mirkala Kahnstein, who lived in the mid-16th century and then died at 23 and has spent the next few centuries roaming the countryside, preying on the daughters of noble men. Uh, using a variety of names, all anagrams of her name, Mirkala. She's got this great trick. She turns up in somebody's house accompanied by an aunt who then is called away to attend the death of a friend and who's going to look after Mirkala? Of course, the nobleman agrees to because she'll be great company for his daughter. More than great company for his daughter. The daughter uh, then develops a strange illness which gives her nightmares where she dreams that a, a great cat the size of a wolf comes and lies on her in the night and sucks the life out of her. Lots of shots of plump English girls heaving and panting in pristine pillows. And well might they heave and pant considering the more than physical nature of their relationships with Mirkala. Mirkala is played by Ingrid Pitt, the German actress who seems to have made a career out of playing vampires. She also appeared in The Countess, which was made in the same year. Ingrid is much too old to play a 23-year-old and the camera works hard to disguise the age-betraying heavinesses of her flesh, but she has fabulous tits, which the camera takes full advantage of. So S and M, isn't it? It's a Hammer production, so of course everyone is terribly, terribly English. There are some familiar faces. You'll recognise George Cole, who plays Arthur Daly in Minder, a very slim-hipped and sideburned George Cole, playing one of the fathers. And the other father is played by Peter Cushing, who tries desperately to retain his dignity and doesn't quite manage it. The girls are absolutely gorgeous, ingenuous to the point of being mentally retarded. They've got lovely soft hair, lovely big eyes, lovely big breasts. The 1970s is just a little bit early for silicon jobs, so I imagine that they're all naturally breasts which burst forth from the dresses uh, defying the laws of gravity. The dresses actually all completely accentuate this by, uh, you know, being that empire line cut and um, flowing tacky 60s, mostly see-through fabrics. 
The most interesting part is played by Kate O'Mara, who's the governess who we've just seen. She's originally constructed as an agent of the patriarchy, asserting reason and rationality over imagination and superstition. But she falls in love with the vampire. And of course, as soon as she's converted to the per perversions of lesbian passion, she becomes thoroughly evil and thoroughly expendable. <laughs> This is fabulous crap. If the virgin machine was too moody and dark, if desert hearts was too soft, if go fish just made you want to cut your nails, grab a bottle of red, a candelabra, move the television into the bedroom and watch this. I'm Maud Davy, as always it's been my pleasure. Think of me when you touch yourself. Tonight we're reviewing Tank Girl! <laughs> And for those of you who have been on another planet for the last couple of years, Tank Girl is the filmic adaptation of the cult outrageous comic strip of the same name. Well, I love the strip. For a change, it shows two women in the position of heroes instead of heroines. And before you start thinking, oh my god, they made another movie out of a comic book character, throw preconceptions out the window because at least this one harks back to its origins. Set in the year 2033, believe me, the world is not a pretty place. It is not a pretty place now. Have either of you been down to Albert Park recently? Mm. Political, topical, political, topical. Paid political announcement. Anyway, Tank Girl is played with spunky vigour by Laurie Petty. Mm, she's the spiky-haired, slutty, beer-chugging, fag-toting, sexotronic babe with balls, a totally post-apocalyptic heroine, in fact. Take a breath. Thank you, I will. <sighs> well, actually, Tank Girl might be, but I'm not so sure about Laurie Petty. I know she thinks she was perfectly cast, but mm, maybe it's the American accent, but every time she's got a funny line coming up, she pauses before it, and by the time we get there, well, it's just not funny anymore. But what would I know? See for yourselves, what do you think? Supposedly set in the desert. It was actually filmed on location in New Mexico, Arizona and Los Angeles. I didn't know they had kangaroos in Los Angeles. I don't think they do and they don't even have Olivia Newton-John's Koala Blue there anymore. <laughs> um, what about the movie? Oh yes, yeah. oh, okay. it's set during the devastating aftermath of a cosmic cataclysm which has robbed the earth of its life-giving resources. Money. No, stupid. Water. There are three million litres of water underneath the blue dunes. And you will retrieve it. Do I make myself clear, General? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good! There's also a kitschy collection of killer kangaroo mutants called the Rippers. And one of them's played by a rap star, Ice T. Not Ice Cube or mm -hmm. Ice Coffee or any of those other ices. But he sports some nifty prosthetic makeup from Stan Winston. And it doesn't matter how much prosthetics you put on him, how much makeup, he still has that same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Elvis Sneer. <laughs> it's a job he didn't quite love. In an interview, he's quoted as saying, It was the most dreaded experience of my life. Three hours of grueling makeup, you can't get up, you don't go to the bathroom. I oh, must have given him great bladder control. Add to that a rubber suit in 110 Arizona heat. I think I'd get brain damage. I think ST's already got brain damage. Hey, no. Hey, I'm not saying that. I'll get shot down on the pavement <laughs> in a drive by thing by Snoop Doggy Doo. I have two words for you. Brush your teeth! <laughs> I love the wild hairdos and the crazy outfits and the fact that Tank Girl sends up absolutely everything. And I don't agree with Madeline about Low Petty because I think she makes a great Tank Girl and I don't think fans will be disappointed. Oh, that's, I'm not so sure. Mm. I think it's the actual fans of Tank Girl that will like it least. Maybe it's a cultural thing but I think she should have an Aussie accent and unlike Meryl Streep, Laurie Petty doesn't even attempt one. A dingo stole my baby. Hmm. Mm. Tank Girl should be more abrasive, but I did like Jet Girl. And I must say it's rather nice to see the two girlies taking on the bad guys and kicking the crap out of them. <laughs> the music's really cool, and Rachel, Rachel Tallery is bitching. I give the movie an eight and a half. Well, it's, hang on, <laughs> it's great to see that a sci-fi film has finally been made that doesn't involve guys that think with their willies. 
Well, I'm going to give it a six and a half, oh. uh, re regardless of the a few undeveloped minor characters. Oh, uh, hang on. For Christ's sake, it's based on a comic book. But the plot was pretty underdeveloped as well. But oh. I have to admit, I did like the animated sequences, which established the settings. Mm, and I think queer girls will like the Dyke sensibility, especially the bit where Tank Girl gives Jet Girl a big smacker on the lips. That was quite nice. Mm. But ultimately, the movie's unsatisfying, I'm afraid. A bit like a Chinese takeaway, and I can only give it a six and a half as well. Mm. But don't forget, we've still got lots of Tank Girl kits to give away. So remember our questions. Uh, which Icelandic star features on the soundtrack of Tank Girl? And I think I would make a bitching sidekick <laughs> to Tank Girl because... Well, just call 00 55 We have operators waiting. There. Did I tell you to stop? No. Salute me. I'm not too good under pressure. Well, that about wraps it up. Wait, aren't we going to read out one piece of fan mail? Oh, good point. Oh. Oh, oh yes. Um, apparently some apologies are in order, I'm afraid. To the happy couple Ernest and Maria out there in suburbia, we're really sorry. We didn't mean to offend you, and we're not heterophobic, honest. And just to prove that there's no hard feelings, we'd like to send you 2.4 tickets to Tank Girl, courtesy of your YP. Wait a minute, Madeline. Um, we don't have their address. Oh. Um, Ernest and Maria, if you want tickets, you have to call double o double five one five triple nine. Well, that about wraps it up. Next week we'll be looking at. Oh, what's this? Rah, 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 rah. Circle. Uh, sounds like um. Vicious circle. Oh. Dorothy Parker and the Vicious Circle and Braveheart. And uh, Gregoraki's totally fucked up, which is totally fucked up. Oh, now we know what Robert thinks. And I'm Madeline Swain. And I'm Robert Elsith. Good night. Mwah. Sprockets was proudly brought to you by ComCopy, the duplication specialists.